that's bright. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to Hope. Uh, my name is Dan, and I am one of the pastors here uh, at Hope, and it's my privilege this week to get to hang out with you and, and share a few thoughts. Uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, whether on-site or online, uh, we've been going through a summer series called Beholding Jesus. And we're rounding the corner. Uh, we've only got a few weeks left out of a very extensive series. And as David, our senior pastor, mentioned last week, given that these are our final weeks, um, we're exploring different topics that feel a bit more grand um, and bigger in scope. So this week, I have the opportunity to share with you a few thoughts on the kingdom of God, Jesus and the kingdom. Now, Jesus spends a lot of time talking about the kingdom. So if you walk away from today and think, you know what, that Dan, he didn't talk about this, that, or whatever, you'd probably be right. Because today, in our time together, it feels like it would be a drop in a vast bucket probably more like a vast ocean, right? So just right off the bat, gonna let you know that we're not talking about everything regarding the kingdom of God, but it is my prayer to be able to share a few things that I feel like God wants to share with all of us today. So would you join me for a brief moment of prayer? God, thank you so much for these opportunities together, together with one another, and together with you. Holy Spirit, I ask for you to be fully present, whatever that means. Lord, we know that you are here and it's an honor to be in your presence. So Lord, open up our hearts, open up our minds, open up our ears, open up all of who we are that we might behold you, that we might see you that much more and that we might worship you as a result. Thank you, God, for being in this place, being for us and not against us. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So quick note as we get going on this topic of Jesus and the kingdom. If you were to look through scripture, you'll often see two different phrases. It'll either be the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And without getting into the nitty gritty, I'm just going to suggest that when you see those two things, they're essentially talking about the same thing. Now, before we can actually jump right into Jesus specifically and the kingdom, I feel like we need to take some time and work our way back in time to get some context to see exactly why is this topic so significant, right? Uh, I'm not a historian, but I appreciate history because it can give us some great context. So journey in your hearts and minds, if you will, with me back into the days of the Old Testament, the early books of the Bible. In the first one called Genesis, which means beginning, we see that in Genesis chapter 12, God calls someone by the name of Abram. Now, Abram was a man at this time of 75 years of age. Uh, not young, that's all I'll say, right? And Abram, like many others in his day, simply lived with the rest of his family in whatever locality they were in. But Jesus calls, or not Jesus, God calls Abram and says, Abram, follow me. Come to a place that I will show you. Uh, where are we going, God? I just said I'll show it to you. Don't worry about it. God doesn't say those words, but essentially God is extending an invitation for Abram to follow him. But with this invitation to follow, God includes a promise to Abram saying, Abram, I will make you into a great nation. <gasps> that sounds cool. God goes on to say that you will be a blessing to other nations. And so there's this promise that as Abram follows God, that Abram will also become a nation himself. Because back in that day, that's kind of the top of your game. King of the hill status, right? At that time, it was just Abram and his wife, and they begin this journey. Now, it wasn't until 25 years later that Abram, later has his name changed to Abraham, it wasn't until 25 years later at the age of 100 that he has his first biological son. So God may have been, quote, unquote, late, but he's, he's not late. He's on time, but it just took some time. So with Abram comes his son Isaac. Isaac ends up having a pair of twins. Or not, this doesn't make sense. That would be four people. A pair of twins? Have twins? Anyway, he had twins, Jacob and Esau. Now, Jacob was the one that ends up having his name switched as well to Israel. Ring any bells? And now Israel has 12 sons of his own who end up becoming the heads of 12 respective tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. But Israel didn't become a nation until after the Exodus event, 
What I mean by that is that all of these Hebrews were in captivity in the nation of Egypt, and it wasn't until God delivered them with the help of Moses that other surrounding nations began to finally address the Israelites as a nation, right? national identity. So as I'm sharing more about this, think about kingdom, kingdom, kingdom of God, kingdom, kingdom, nations and kingdoms. Right? So finally, they are a nation themselves. But things get a little bit wonky because even though Israel was founded as a godly nation with godly principles, they began to have a change of heart. I mean, if there was ever a nation that was for God, this was it. God literally established Israel as a nation. And yet, in the book of 1 Samuel, we see an interesting dynamic. The people of God look around to all those that surround them and say, you know what, we want more of what they've got. Particularly a king. God, you're cool, <laughs> but we want a king that we can see, that we can interact with. Give us a king. So, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 17 to 19 says this. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you have said, No, appoint a king over us. So now, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. Israel used to be a theocracy. In other words, a nation who saw a deity, a god, as their ultimate ruler. But here things shift. They want a human king. And so as the story goes, Saul, a man named Saul, is appointed to become Israel's very first king. But that didn't last long, because inevitably, Saul screws up, like we all do. And so God appoints a successor, a young boy named David, who would eventually take the throne as king. Does it stay great forever? No, definitely not, because David makes his own catastrophic failures, and even his progeny end up making some really poor decisions to where the once great nation of Israel experiences civil war. The people can't get along. They start fighting. And this great nation actually splits and fractures into two, Israel and Judah. And when all of this strife and turmoil is happening within the people of God, within God's kingdom, the surrounding nations look at this as a prime opportunity for conquest. Let's get them, boys, right? And so essentially, over a period of time, these surrounding nations come attacking, attacking, attacking to where Israel is no more. All the people of Israel, all the people of those early 12 tribes are now taken, scattered across that part of the world as they enter into exile and oppression. Things went downhill fast. Civil war, a lot of things going on. Some of the different people groups that subjugated this nation of Israel, the Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, Syrians, and eventually the Romans. And this didn't just happen like two or three years at a time. Tens and twenties, fifties, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years pass where they're not Israelites anymore. They're called the Jews now, where the Jews are living under captivity of these different people groups. So while everyone else is having fun because they're strong, because they're prominent, because they're significant, these Jews are just left eating scraps off the table. Whatever happens to be left, that's what they get. This is what they've been reduced to. And so now, when we think about this topic of the kingdom and these incredibly difficult experiences of the Jews, it's not hard to imagine just how much God's people longed for a better day. How much they longed for freedom, prosperity, and even revenge, retaliation against their enemies to regain just even a measure of the significance that they had enjoined. You know, sure, these situations condition them to want a kind of kingdom and a kind of savior, but it's not entirely their fault because some of the prophets that God sent to serve and minister to God's people during times of exile also painted a picture that would lead these Jews to think that the coming one The saving when the Messiah will come with great power, 
to reestablish us and set things right. So we're going to take a look at Isaiah chapter 61. And this is part of a larger series of passages where Isaiah, speaking on behalf of God, begins to paint a picture of what the coming Messiah, a.k.a. the saving one, would look like. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. And when it says me, it's referring to the Messiah. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me, the Messiah, to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair." So here we see that this Messiah will come to bring freedom and great things to the people of God. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Sounds magnificent. Let's skip down to verse 7. The Messiah continuing to speak on what he will do for his people. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. Sounds great. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. And so as a group of people that knew what it felt like to be on the losing team for a really long time, all of these things sounded so great to them. But when will it happen? And that was the big question. And yet they longed for, they prayed for the coming of the saving one, the Messiah, who would bring with him the kingdom of God. But is that the kind of savior that showed up on the scene? Let's look at Mark chapter 1. And just verses 14 and 15. So this is Mark chapter 1, the first chapter. So almost right out the gate, we see Jesus beginning to do things. And very early on, after being baptized by his cousin, John the baptizer, we see this happening in Mark 14. It says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Oh, did you hear what he said? What did he just say? Did he just say the kingdom of God is coming? Is it time? Is it happening now? Is he the Messiah? What's going on? See, sometimes when I read passages like this, I'm like, okay, cool. Jesus is saying he's coming. Fun, right? But for the people of his day, particularly for the Jewish people, this immediately caught people's attentions. The kingdom of God is here. Is it our time? Is it going to happen? And these pictures, these imaginations of what it would look like begin to surface and come to mind. And so as Jesus begins proclaiming that the good news is that the kingdom of God is near, is this what they expected it to be? And the short answer is no. This wasn't really what they were expecting because the Jews had hoped for liberation. They wanted a champion to rise up and fight on their behalf. They wanted this Messiah to establish an order that would suit their needs. They wanted freedom from oppression. They wanted significance, renown, and respect. A kingdom that would offer opportunities for success, prosperity, comfort. And with it, they wanted a king that would advance their agendas, serve their needs, and support their pursuits. And as this king goes about establishing this order, they wanted to look at other people and say, hey, you, fall in line. This is it right here. Or face imminent defeat. This is what they were hoping for. And in what ways do we often find ourselves longing for the exact same things? And so for me, the irony is that all kingdoms, past, present, and future will never be able to bring to us the full satisfaction, completion, and wholeness that we all so desperately desire and even need. I mean, humanity has been at this a really long time, and we still can't seem to get it right. I mean, even in the nation, or the history of God's people, the nation of Israel, Saul screwed it up real quick. 
All the world's systems of culture, government, law, economy, education, and entertainment can only bring small measures of relief because we only know so much. We only can control so little. Kingdoms, empires, and governments made by our own hands can't possibly get us up out of our own fallenness towards true life and wholeness because none of these kingdoms can truly address the conditions of the human heart. Instead, they only lead possibly to behavior modification. I mean, aren't those what laws do in essence? You've got laws to try to either encourage or discourage certain kinds of behaviors. And while laws can be effective in creating a sense of order, I think they fall short in being able to instigate true transformation of people's hearts. I mean, what kind of kingdom can cause you to forfeit power and position to willingly serve other people? How can we govern that? What kinds of laws could make that happen? Or to seek the wellness of your enemies, even at the expense of your own well-being? How are you going to legalize that? To extend forgiveness and mercy to those who have brought you offense, or even to not be afraid of pain, suffering, and even death. No government, system, or kingdom of this world could do any of that. And so, God wants to offer us better by bringing to us his kingdom. Again, Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus says, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So just to provide like a working definition, something that you might be able to hold on to after today, I'm just going to suggest that the kingdom of God is the reign and rulership of God. It's where God can essentially have his way, a God who is perfect, a God who is love, where his heart and will can be uninhibited, unrestrained, and find complete fulfillment. Wherever that is at work, that is where the kingdom of God is. And it's a kingdom like we've never seen or even experienced, and yet the kingdom of God is what would truly remedy all that which ails our humanity. And the good news is that this kingdom isn't like way over there. The good news is that this kingdom is near. And it's near because Jesus is near. You see, through Jesus, we now have a way directly to the Father as we were being adopted into his family and brought into his kingdom. And that's where we get to experience true life and transformation. It's true that sin and rebellion caused the great fracture, the great divide. And yet, and yet, through Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, we have the opportunity to say, Jesus, where I have failed, where we all have collectively failed, you, Jesus, have done it. All of creation obeys you. Nature obeys you. These spirits obey you. You have full authority. Death could not hold you. You laid your life down for us so that we might have an opportunity. No, we have access, true access to forgiveness that would shift our position in the eyes of the Father being brought into his kingdom. And so Jesus, I receive you. I receive you as my personal Lord, my King, my Messiah, my saving one. I will follow you. And you see, when that happens, when we behold Jesus and we say yes to him, we are brought into the kingdom of God where we become citizens there and experience all that God has for us. Jesus is the fulfillment that God would send a saving one. He brings then with him this kingdom, this kingdom of heaven, this kingdom of God. Jesus makes it clear. In fact, there's a passage in Luke chapter 4 where it says that Jesus and his homies were going to church. 
It says they were going to the synagogue as that they were accustomed to doing. And so they went. And during those times, they would take passage of scripture, not from pieces of paper, but scrolls. And they would take turns reading and sometimes teaching. And in that time, it says that Jesus was there. And someone hands Jesus a scroll. In other words, Jesus didn't pick one himself, but he was handed the scroll. Lo and behold, it's the scroll of Isaiah. So Jesus opens it up. He looks through it. And scripture says in Luke that he looks, Jesus looks for the passage in Isaiah 61 that we just read. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he begins to read that by bringing freedom, by bringing good news. And then he finishes and he puts the scroll down. And in Luke, it says that all the people's eyes were on Jesus. And Jesus steps back and says, today, this scripture that I just read is fulfilled in your midst. Jesus was saying that he is God's Messiah, bringing God's kingdom to heaven. So what's it look like, this kingdom? What's happening here? If we look at Isaiah 61, some of the things it says is that the good news is being proclaimed to the poor. Freedom for the prisoners. Blind are receiving sight. The oppressed are being set free. And all are beginning or continuing to hear that God is fulfilling the promises that he's made from days ago. And then in case we were wondering, Jesus is also here setting the record straight, resetting, reframing our expectations, not only of what the kingdom of God looks like, but what the people of God look like. So let's look at a pretty well-known passage, I think, from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. Thinking about kingdoms here, the people of God. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and, when, and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. The what? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And even in these verses, we see that Jesus begins to clarify what it means to be blessed and to be God's people. It's interesting to me that things, the things that don't make their way onto this list that Jesus just shares. I don't see Jesus saying things like, blessed are the powerful and prominent, the strong or the smart, the self-sufficient ones, the spectacular, the impressive. And even the characteristics that we normally associate with those times that people say, hashtag blessed, don't make it onto this list. And you know, that whole hashtag thing, I'm not saying that those aren't expressions of God's blessings over us, but that and what we see here seem to be on pretty different wavelengths, don't you think? You know, it's interesting when you line up this passage in Matthew 5 with Isaiah 61, particularly the last verse where in Isaiah it says, all who see them, aka the people of God, will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. This is a theme of blessing with the people of God. But I'm pretty sure that we don't often look at those who are poor or hungry or persecuted or merciful and think, yeah, they're the blessed ones out there. Mm. And you know, if we were evaluating things according to our world's standards, then sure, maybe we'd be right. But God's kingdom is perfect and eternal. So when all other kingdoms will inevitably fade away and when Jesus comes back, to usher in the fullness of God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, then it's true that everyone will confess and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Our citizenship then is not with any kingdom of this world. For we are citizens of an entirely different kingdom marked by our love, our intimacy, our submission and our obedience to our Father along with the Father's reign, rulership, and authority. Because in this context, that's where we get to experience true life. And this identity rises above all other identities. Being a citizen of God's kingdom rises above nationality, demographic, background, even preference. 
because we are now all primarily sons and daughters of God. Everything else falls below that. It doesn't mean that we ignore our culture. It means that we can transcend it. And it's in this manner that we can fulfill what Jesus prays for in John chapter 17 when he asks God the Father, may they be united. Not by any other things. Sure, there can be a few things, but the thing that unites them will be that they are committed to God alone and his kingdom. Your heart, Father, that is what they will long for. That is who they will live for. That is who they will die for. I was born in South Korea. My family came to the United States when I was two and a half years old. My dad was the first in our family to get get his uh, U.S. citizenship. I have two younger brothers and both were born in the States and so they became U.S. citizens that way. The last two people in our family to become U.S. citizens were myself and my mom. I became a U.S. citizen one month before my 17th birthday while I was in high school. And I was gonna bring you the, the citizenship form like as a prop, but then I looked at it and there's like in really big red letters, do not copy or risk legal, legal ramifications. I said, like, okay, I'm not going to jail for this. <laughs> um, and plus it goes on the internet, so maybe it's a wise thing. But I was gonna show it to you, but at 16 I became a US citizen. My friends knew about this, and so I remember this conversation I had with some of my friends at the school lunch table. Yo, so Dan, check this out. Here's a scenario. You are born in South Korea. All your family lives there. And it's true, I've got a pretty big extended family. 95% of them live on the other side of the planet. Dan, if the US and South Korea went at it, like, who would you fight with? Because <laughs> see, I did have the option to be a dual citizen. I chose not to. I remember this thought process. And so it didn't take long for me to respond and say, I'd fight alongside the US. And for some of them, that blew their minds. Like, what, your family's still over there? What if you literally have to go against them? And I thought about it and I said, you know what? When I became a US citizen, I took these things into consideration. Even as a dummy 16 year old, I, I thought things through just a little bit. But I was like, this is where I grew up, right? This is the place that gave me some opportunities and so this is where I will pledge my allegiance. When we are citizens of the kingdom of God, it's not a dual citizenship kind of scenario. Yes, we are current temporary residents of this place or whatever place we happen to occupy, but our hearts are secured in eternity, in heaven, with God. And that means when it comes to allegiance and loyalty, it's all about who God is. Matthew 6, Jesus says it this way, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first. It doesn't mean don't seek anything else, but when it comes to what you seek, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And with that comes a promise that all other things will be added to us. We're part of something so much bigger as Christians, as followers, as disciples, as those that belong to the Lord. And so as we go from this place, as we look at the world outside of us, and as we begin to look at the world inside of us, what can we then do? What do we do? We pray that God's kingdom continues to come on earth as it is in heaven a place where God's dominion, his heart, his generosity, his love, his salvation, all that he has is now being brought into where we are because we carry that within us as people of God. This is what it means to be citizens of God, to be a part of his kingdom. And for this, Jesus lived and died. And for this, Jesus gives us an invitation to come. So let's pray this prayer that we see Jesus teaching his disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6. And as we pray this, let's pray this. Not just say it, let's pray this. Let's pray this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. Amen.